feel like I'm far away from y'all. I like to feel a part of the group. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And I trust that um, and hope that you had time to kind of sit at God's feet and, and marinate in the truth just from these couple of verses and see... Um, some of the sweet things in his word that he's given to nourish our soul. Remember, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this is really what he has given us. It is a gift to us. His word is. And even our scripture today is going to teach us about that and remind us of how important it is to nourish ourselves so that we can be equipped um, for all that God has called us to do in Christ. So let's read these two verses in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. His divine power. The Greek word for this um, word power is, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, I'll spell it for you, D-U-N-A-M-I-S, and it's where we get our word dynamite. Dynamite. His divine power. We know from the rest of Scripture that when we are united with Christ by faith, a gift from God, that we are given the Holy Spirit. And the Word tells us that that Holy Spirit is a power that is at work in us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 says this. If I can get there. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And one of my favorite passages in Scripture is found in that first chapter of Ephesians. And and many um, of my friends who have been around me will often hear me quoting this. But Ephesians 1 verse 18 says this, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You see some of those same words, that idea of being called by him we're going to talk about in a little while. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And listen to this, verse 19. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That power, did you hear that? That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead as is at work in you. Is that not amazing? and overwhelming. The first time I read these verses and really saw that phrase, I was like, oh my goodness, what God has given me, the power that he has given me through his spirit, through the work of his son, is completely at my disposal. And that power is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I want you just to think about it. Peter goes on to say that his divine power has given us everything everything that we need. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's divine power has given you everything that you need for life and godliness? What else do you think that you need? What else do you think that you need? 
And ladies, I must confess to you that there are lots of days that I get up and I tell God exactly what I think I need for life and godliness. But God has told me here in his word that he has already given me everything I need for life and godliness. And what we have to remember too, that this is what we need and it's not necessarily what we want. But God has given us everything that we need for life to live. Eternal life. That's what God has given us, right? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's given us eternal life. And a lot of times we think about that only in the future aspect of that. That we're going to live forever and we will with him. But our eternal life begins even now. As we experience the riches and the glory of knowing God. Of being able to live in his presence. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. He's given us the power to live, and it begins now. It's not just in the future, but it is right now that we have the power to live. He's given us this, everything we need for life and godliness. Godliness is a genuine reverence toward God that governs one's attitude toward every aspect of life. It's a, a genu genuine reverence toward God that governs one's attitude toward every aspect of life. If you are a daughter of the king, then all of your life is sacred. And all that you've been called to do, every hat that you wear, every place that you go, you take him with you. And he is the lens that you look through as you think about ways to honor and glorify him in his life. A genuine reverence that impacts every piece of who you are. It's a love for the things of God and a walk in the ways of God. That's what he's given us. Everything we need to love him as we should and to walk in his ways. Everything. And how has he given this to us? Verse 3 says, he's given this to us through our knowledge, our knowledge of him who called us. Our knowledge of him, our full discernment of him. It's more than just knowing about him, but it's really knowing him. It's a more intimate and personal relationship. And I think for those of you who are able to do your lesson, I put a definition in one of your questions, again, the Greek word, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, is E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And I want you to listen to this definition again. It denotes exact or full knowledge, discernment, recognition, and is a strengthened form of no, just knowledge, the Greek word for knowledge. It expresses a fuller or a full knowledge, a greater, listen to this last part, a greater participation by the knower in the object being known. A greater participation by the knower in the object being known, thus more powerly, powerfully influencing him. A greater participation by the knower in the object known thus more powerfully influencing him. Ladies, the book of James tells us that the demons know God and they believe in him. But do you really know him? Do you know him? Do you have that intimate and personal relationship with God that can only come when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on our behalf? We can't just know about him, but do we know him? Do we really, really know him? This is the second mention of this word knowledge already in the first four verses of the first chapter of 2 Peter. Um, last week, we read this in verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So we were told last week that through this knowledge, through this intimate, personal understanding of who God is, 
that we can have grace and peace and that we also have his divine power. See, one of the reasons Peter is really driving this home is because what is he going to remember? The, remember that very first week we talked about, it's, this book is about holiness, heresy, and hope, right? And so we're going to hit pretty hard, Laurie talked about this a little bit this morning as we began our worship, about some of the false teaching and some of the heresy that has come in to the church and how we can combat that. Well, we've got to know. We've got to have knowledge. We've got to know the real thing in order to know what the counterfeit thing is. And Peter is saying that is so important in our lives. Knowledge, knowing me. How do you know somebody? How do you know somebody? You spend time with them, don't you? You listen to them. You listen to their heart and what they, what's important to them and what they love and what they cherish. And you, and you sit in their presence and you do things with them and you, and you just enjoy being with them. Right? That's how you know somebody. Do you really know God? Not about Him, but do you know Him? His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. And what do we learn about him? This God that we have knowledge of who called us, who called us by his own glory and goodness. God, if you were his, called out to you first. Everywhere in scripture, you will see a God that is an initiator. A God who gives up everything that is rightfully His and comes down to earth. Why? To be close to you. To have a relationship with you. God is the initiator. And the reason that we have come to Him, the reason that we have responded to this grace that He has offered us freely in Christ is because He called us. He called us. John 10 Verse 27 speaks of Jesus as a shepherd. And listen to what it says. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. We hear his call and we follow him. And then he goes on and he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Romans 11 verse 29 tells us that the call of God on our life is irrevocable. We can't refuse it. When he calls out to us, we respond by grace through faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1 Verse 9. I'm going to begin in verse 8. It says, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us, what? To a holy life. Not because of anything we have done. Did you hear that? Who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. God has called us to be his own. He's called us to live a holy life, and it's not because of anything that we've done. It's simply because of his own purpose and grace. Romans 8 also shed some light on this idea of being called. If you look in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called. Right? For those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. The idea of being called to a holy life, right? That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, 
he also called. Those he called, he also justified. He made right with God. He declared to be right and righteous and holy before him because of what Jesus has done. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? Listen to this. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God did not spare his son, do you not think that he is going to give you everything that you need for life and godliness? He gave you his son. His one and only Son. And if he gave him up for you, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give you all things, everything that you need for life and godliness? Ladies, this is a transforming truth. And it makes more of God and it makes less of me. And the result of that is that I will bow in gratitude. Thank you that you called out to me. Thank you that you called out to me and that you rescued me. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, we looked at that last semester as we went through the book of 1 Peter. God tells us that he called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Why? So that we might declare his praises. Glory to God. You've called me. I'm yours. And you've made me a part of this great and glorious plan of redemption. He called us, Second Peter says, by his own glory and goodness. By his own glory and goodness. The excellence of God. And we see this in, manifested in two different ways in these words. His glory is the excellence of his being. It's just who he is. It's his character. It's his attributes and his, his very being, his very essence. And we know from other places in Scripture that that part of who God is is unchanging. He never changes. And his goodness is his excellence expressed in deeds. His virtue in action. How he treats us and how he responds to us based on the very character, the very essence of who he is. He has given us his very great and precious promises through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. And he uses both of those things to bring us to salvation. Peter goes on to say that through these, and I think he's referring back to at that point, through these, his glory and goodness, the very essence of who he is, his very character, and his actions, where he, how he treats us and how he responds to us, through these, his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. This is the second time Peter has also used this word given, right? It's the second time in these two verses that he used this word given in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need. And in verse 4, he's given us his very great and precious promises. That word given means that he has bestowed on us graciously. I love the word in the first chapter of Ephesians that says he's lavished these things upon us. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ and God has lavished those upon us. He has bestowed them graciously to us. This word given is in the perfect tense and I want you to listen to this. What it means is that it occurred in the past as a completed action. But the effect is still going on. It's done. It's finished. Right? 
Jesus came. All of this was accomplished on your behalf. And all of this is at your disposal. It's a done deal. It occurred in the past. It's a completed action. But the effect of that is still going on in your life. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? Peter has said that he has given us, he has bestowed graciously upon us his very great and precious promises. And as I was preparing to teach you this morning, um, one of the times when I was sitting in my place at my house where I, I, I read my Bible and study and pray, I began to think of just the promises of God that came to mind. And I want to tell you the ones that I just listed right here. And I want you to listen and I want you to think about this. God has told us that he will never leave us or forsake us. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's from John 14, 8. And it's when God is promising us that he will send us the Holy Spirit. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. The Lord our God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with singing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusts in thee. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I am making everything new. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. I've just scratched the surface. I read somewhere in my study, and I can't verify this to you, but I'm just going to put it out there, that there were over 30,000 promises in God's Word. 30,000! His very great and precious promises. In the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19, we read these encouraging words. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And in the book of Joshua, chapter 21, God is talking about his love for his people. He speaks of the nation of Israel, but we know that that is a picture that is expanded in the Bible and begins to include us, not just the nation of Israel. And this is what God says in his word in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Not one. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Psalm 145, verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. Do you know the promises of God? Do you know them? Where do you find them? Here. His word. Do you know the promises of God? Are they very great and precious to you? 
A.W. Tozer said this, the promises of God rest completely upon his character. We need today a fresh anticipation that springs out of the promises of God. We must declare war on the mood of non-expectation. True faith is never alone. It is always accompanied by expectation. The man who believes the promises of God expects them to be fulfilled. Do you truly expect to see the promises of God fulfilled in your in your day-to-day -day life? Do you truly expect to see the promises of God fulfilled in your day-to-day -day life? Tozer says we need to declare war on the mood of non-expectation. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says this, But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Another guy I read some of his work that I'm not really familiar with, his name is Vance Havner. I want you to listen to what he says. He says, there are sickly Christians living on crackers and cheese when they have a standing invitation to the feast of the grace of God's promises. There are sickly Christians living on crackers and cheese when they have a standing invitation to the feast of the grace of God's promises. God's promises are checks to be cashed. They're not mere mottos to hang on the wall. At the end of verse 4, Peter tells us that these uh, great, very great and precious promises were given to us so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now we have to be careful here because we need to understand that we will never be God, little gods, right? That's not what it means here when it says that we're going to participate in the divine nature. So we need to think about what does it mean for us to participate in the divine nature? But well, we know, and we've already talked about this this morning, that when we come to God through Christ, that we are indwelt by God through the Holy Spirit. Remember, the promise from the beginning of time has been God's presence to his people. And we see that manifested all throughout Scripture. And the New Testament tells us that now what? Our bodies are the temple of the living God. That he lives within us. That he dwells within us. And so we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and this allows us to participate in the divine nature. Why? Because it gives us the power to bear his image more fully and escape the corruption in the world. It gives us the power to be what we were created to be, image bearers of God, to be transformed and made more like Christ. It redeems us. It makes us new creatures so that we're not controlled just by the flesh and the sinful nature anymore, but we're able to say no, right? And escape the corruption of the world. It gives us the power to say no to sin. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you. And it gives you the power of that sin that you bow down to every day and say, I can't do this. God says, yes, you can. Yes, you can say no. I've given you the power. 
John Piper says this, it is a liberation from sin and likeness to God, and it comes by knowing and trusting in those very great and precious promises. Do you understand that at the beginning of time when God created us, it tells us that he, we were created in his image. What does that mean? It means that he stamped his image upon us. And we know from the book of Ephesians and other places in God's word is that he redeems us and he chooses us and he calls out to us again. Why? To the praise of his glorious grace that we might more fully reflect and bear that image. And that's what God's covenant of grace does for us. That's what the gospel does for us. It steps into our life and it gives us power to fulfill our purpose. It gives us power to do what we were created to do. When God says he gave you, he created us in his image, the picture that we get there is if you think about it, in, 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 in the Bible times, in Old Testament times, there was no media, there was no news, there was no newspaper. No one knew what the king looked like, did they? No one knew his face like we do. We can turn on the TV and we see the people that are in charge. We know who's running our kingdom. But no one knew what the king looked like. And so the, what they would do is they would have stamps or coins and things like that. And they would stamp a picture of the king on that. And they would take it throughout the kingdom and they would say, here's your king. This is what he looks like. And the people would know who was in charge. Do you understand that that is what God has done for us when he created us in his image? He has stamped a an image of who he is upon us. And he, then he says, okay, that was messed up and broken and marred by sin. But when Jesus comes into our lives and he makes us new creatures, he makes us more fully able to bear that image again. And so what God does is he's sending us out. And we're able, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that divine power that's at work in us, to more fully bear his image so that people can say, this is what the king looks like. This is who's in charge. This is the one who is ruling and reigning. And we have that privilege and that honor as his children to participate in the divine nature and to escape the corruption of the world so that we can go and tell them, this is what the king is like. Don't you want to know him? This is what he's like. Ladies, we are without excuse. I am without excuse. Because we have everything at our disposal. Everything that we need. I came across this example that I thought was a good picture of kind of what's going on in these verses. A word picture. And John Piper wrote it, but I want you to listen to what he says, this, this picture that he paints for us. He says, if you are a prisoner of war in a concentration camp and you have lost hope and hopeless, you've thrown your morality away and you learn that a prisoner exchange is being planned and you see the guard coming down the road, pointing to individual prisoners and calling them to follow him to freedom and family. It is not a mere piece of knowledge when he points to you and calls you. It is power. The power of hope surges through your body because you know you've been called. So when Peter says that divine power for hope and godliness flows through the knowledge of our call to glory, we can feel what he means. If we could but see the glory and excellence of God and know that our creator has approached us and said, you there, come. I'm going to show you my glory and give you an eternal life to enjoy it. It would mean power. The power of hope and the power of godliness. You know this from experience when you see the glory and excellence of God most clearly and know he has set his affection on you. This is when you have power to live as you ought. My prayer is that we would take hold 
of all that has been given, all that has been graciously bestowed, all that has been lavished upon us in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in our sin and in our misery and in our hopelessness and in our rejection of you and who you are, Lord, that you called out to us. We thank you for the gift of salvation and we thank you that it's based on your character on your excellency, on your glory and your goodness, and not on our own merit, because, Lord, we fall short. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for your Son. We thank you that he is the only one who deserves your favor. And that because he came to earth and stood in our place and lived the perfect life we couldn't live and died the death that we deserved, Father, that we now can belong to you. We thank you that he's risen again, that he gives us eternal life. Lord, that he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And we thank you that we can experience the joys and the pleasures and the glories of living in your presence. Not perfectly now, but we do get taste. We can taste and see that you're good. And Father, we rejoice in that this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the promises in your word. Lord, would you make us women who long to take hold of those, who long to know those, who want to hide them in our heart, who put them before us daily, Lord. And we thank you for the power that you give us through that, through your promises. Lord, we thank you for the power that's at work in us that is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Would you remind us of that daily? And Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing in us. And Lord, we thank you that you've made a way for us to fulfill our purpose, to do exactly what you created us to do. Lord, I pray that you would encourage the hearts of each individual woman here this morning, Lord, that she would know that she's yours, Lord, I pray for women in this room, Lord, who might be hearing that call for the first time. Lord, that they would respond and that they would bow the knee and understand that they desperately, desperately need you and that they would experience the joy that there is in knowing and loving you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your work. And make us women who are overwhelmed that you have set your affection upon us. I pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.